Hello and welcome to a new version of Techman Talks Dynamics. I'm joined by Matt, James, Liz. Uh, welcome everybody. Hello. Hi. Hello. Uh, we're in the middle of the summer, so some of us have been on holiday, some of us are going on holiday, and Microsoft dropped rather unannounced a little bit of information. Quite early, yeah. Quite early. We normally get this middle, information middle July, yeah. about July, and the information was the new information about the Wave 2 release of Business Central 23, which will ship round about, or begin to ship, should I say, round about October this year. So they call them waves because they don't just land all at once, they all come in bits and pieces. Um, well, that, yeah, time, that's where we have to put a bit of a disclaimer in, yeah. isn't it? Because this is what they are suggesting will be make up Wave yeah, it 2. Yeah, can, can change. Um, but it could change, it could come out well, to read staggered. it, important. Some of the functionality described in this release plan has not been released. Delivery times may change and projected functionality may not be released. See Microsoft policy. So they've got... You have to speed that up for the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Terms and conditions apply. I.e., we think we might do this, but we might not do it. And usually it's so, most so of it comes is, out. So this is shape, what's caught our eye that people probably should be aware of, especially if you're using those areas and working in those areas and considering development in those areas that there's, these changes are coming because and they a lot be of this we haven't seen yet, have we? We've just not read the documentation. No, it's not, and, and we've just looked through and it doesn't look like any of it's available for public preview yet either. So, so the public, we, public preview should land 1st of September. Which is coincidentally my birthday, because obviously <laughs> nothing I'd like better than a, a Business Central Half new birthday. release. Yeah. Um, but um, so it comes out on first of October, and they always do the, the. You can build your sandbox with the preview in it a month before that, and generally the documentation arrives a month before that. But it arrived early. July, like, yeah. So it's a good, um, probably good signpost of what what is coming, where the direction, the way the software is going. I know some of the information uh, from what you lot have said, because I've not really looked at it in detail, is a little light, but there's some good headlines and again, pointing on uh, on, on where we're going. So we've got it on the screen uh, for uh, for everyone to, to, to view. Uh, Matt did bring in a nice little uh, prop here, just, uh, just to take us back a little bit. This is for those that are under 30. Um, uh, it was a CD, it wasn't even a DVD. <laughs> this was a, so we've got a CD and this is an Avision Financials version 2.0. Oh, yeah. So we brought this in because some people say, where's the naming convention come from? I think everyone assumes it's because it's 23, that's the year. Yep. It's got absolutely nothing to do with that. It is coming from it's the It's pure the coincidence. Vision. that yeah. This year it's aligned yeah. for a while. Um, but it is that, and so that's uh, straight from your, um, we just found well, out, your, your personal <laughs> collection of IT um, memorabilia. memorabilia yeah. So yeah. Um, we've looked after that, <laughs> put some gloves on to hold it. There's <laughs> a hoofing big scratch on the back. But um, so that's where that's where it all started back in the day, um, the Vision Financials, and now we've come all the way through to Business Central, the evolution of the product. That was about 1997, I would guess. Well, it works with Office, Windows 98, so whether that oh, shipped a bit earlier yeah, or a little not bit later. Sure, or, than that, yeah. Yeah, it worked with Windows 95, 98, and NT for those that uh, oh, nice. bring back happy warm memories. If right. this came up at auction, it would be worth. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's let's dive in and have a look. I mean, they, they start in the documentation with the Power Platform, which is obviously becoming more and more embedded and uh, linked to yeah. the Dynamics products now. Is there anything out of the four or five uh, areas on there that we think are, are are worth mentioning? Well, they've changed the modification limits. So uh, previously, if you did a lot of changes in Power Platform and kind of a bulk data change, um, it was limited to actually only updating 100 records. So you could kind of get out of sync if you if you know if if you just let it uncontrolled. They've changed that from 100 to 1,000, um, which is better. Um, I understand why they've got the limit there in terms of performance and kind of. Um, you know, control, uh, I guess, but, um, you know, there's still going to be situations where a thousand is problematic, I think, where you say every in, every record in your item table where, where you know, you try and update all of your um, unit cost or fields or something of that nature, um, but... You use edit in Excel maybe to... Some yeah, I mean that's that's the point, I guess, is is what you're trying to use it for. But you're still gonna the the point about having a constraint about how much data that you can change via um, that method, the business events feature, is that you're gonna have to build some control that says don't go mad. Mm. Um, and you know, okay, you can change the throttle from a hundred to a thousand, but until it's unlimited, yeah. you're so still, still gonna have hard, to have a control hard, yeah, hard yeah, to make sure that your your data integrity um, is maintained. 
Okay, so that's that's something that good. And, and this is one which I know we it's been mentioned a like lot. We talk about Power Platform a lot in in Power Automate. What we can do. They started to put more. They call them business events. I guess those are triggers or hooks into Business Central that allow you to hook into that from Power Automate. Yeah, you, I mean traditionally it's been kind of read. Well, sorry, modify, delete, insert kind of triggers that could then f- uh, fire off a Power Automate flow. Um, but now there's actual business events. Yeah, you know, typical one when a sales order is released. So there's there's more events in the application. Which can then trigger yeah, yeah. something to happen, uh, which you, allows yes. you to, to think of more business cases where you, you may be able to... And, and we can develop this. our own as well. And I know we've talked about this, uh, stepping outside of Business Central, this is where the data is moving out of just being staying or living in BC to, to go into Power Automate, which is like the workflow, and can then trigger lots of other things within the Microsoft. It, it, it's seamless flow across multiple applications, really, which is what everybody wants and, and expects. Um, and I, I think, you know, this is, you know, if you... If you for those who've been around the NAV world, in NAV 2016, we got events full stop in... in um, Business Central, and when we first got them, there weren't that many, and and kind of developers were saying, "Well, I can't do this using events because there isn't an event where I need one." Um, I think business events, you know, they're going to proliferate across the application um, more and more, and it will be interesting to see quite how many we end up with from Microsoft, um, because there's lots of different scenarios that are going to get requested, and are they going to just let, you know, uh, events in. Uh, the the AL code, if you like, in the, in the in the core code. Now there's so many; it's kind of almost which one six you, you could use. Yeah, yeah where yeah. you could, you know, multiple choices because everybody comes up with a reason why they need one here. Are they going to do the same with business events? Or are they going to keep it quite tight? Because they haven't listed any in the documentation, from what I can see, as in any examples, have they? They just say they're going no. to include. Yeah, the information more. we have at this stage is still very limited, yeah. isn't it? And yeah. it's the it's the kind of hooks that in effect, um, allow a process to be kicked off within Business Central versus, uh, you know, that seamless flow so that something happens in an application over here and it almost something happens uh, across the Business Central and vice versa. Um, I, I think that's a real kind of, it is a key technology. It's going to be very, very significant going forward. Yeah. Um, I, I think we're all, I mean, I'm, I'm, probably a bit cynical and old I'm, I'm kind of if it's business critical how you're going to make sure that it, it works every time how bulletproof is it for mission critical applications and so on I guess performance it's still it's early not days have, yeah if you've got lots of things happening at once without cause a problem it, it, on the it depends how far you push it I mean yeah. You know, notification, you know, popping up teams message adaptive cards when something happens yeah. that's really useful and people want that and then that can make a big difference I think to the process you know <laughs> Integrating and uh, you know and pushing it a bit too far, yeah. I think you've got to be careful as to how, right how you use right, it. Yeah. Right. yeah. What's the de- what's the kind of dependent the business dependency on it? What's what what will you know what will the consequence be if it doesn't happen? Yeah. Um, and um, typically with an integration, you know, the more elements you get into something. The better, bigger chance of something going wrong because the complexity is going uh, there's an update <laughs> overnight on this and it doesn't quite work anymore or whatever. And how do you how do you maintain that? So there is still value for having stuff built in Business Central, and the only dependency is on Business Central. But um, you know, when you're building kind of uh, you know, you, your manufacturing plant is dependent on something that goes across these you know by this I'd be a little bit cautious about building that now but the notification is a good one because if you don't get those it's probably it, it's inconvenient but it's not probably yeah and they've obviously they've added this um, with better control over Power BI I mean Power BI is becoming more and more uh, used within the reporting and uh, analytics side of it they're now um, looking at this giving you a little bit better it looks more only cosmetic the way it can be displayed within BC I think we've all seen that I remember someone embedding a Power BI report in BC it was like a you postage see stamp it. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's like well you know the one thing you need on this data and more stretch to view, view you know to view the full page yeah. show scorecards I mean we've never really had scorecards in Business Central before no. Um, I, 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 you know, the one thing is is the data refresh. Um, so, you know, if, if you're going to sc- show a scorecard within Business Central and your data is only refreshed once a day, once every 
yeah, eight hack, times yeah. a day. Yeah. That's, is, I that think is that is a bit because, because the people are used to when they're going to business central, it's live, real yes. data. Yeah. So there is a possibility that your Power BI report is showing something different to your role centre mm-hmm. and your number on your role centre. And yeah. Yeah. But look, this is good progress, yeah. and and kind of you know as they it? start to solve the data connectivity issues around Power BI, and we start to become a almost like a, a one pot of data rather than having to move your data into into Power BI and then report. So, from given there. that this is an, an end user podcast, would someone like to explain the Dataverse then? Because that's the other. <laughs> it's a cloud based database. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's your data in. In the cloud, in it, sales tables that can be used by all these different applications. Yeah, the aim is to, you know, if you've got one one place for all data in the Microsoft world, then obviously everything gets a lot easier. At the moment, Business Central is still separate to that. You've got Business the, Central does not run on top of Dataverse. No, it, it, but there but, are. But you've got virtual so tables in the new coming version in. coming. You've got some virtual tables. Yeah, vir- virtual tables data. have been there for a little bit, but what you can basically do They're is... They're limited though, aren't they? So what is a virtual table? Come on, if we're doing end users, yeah, yeah, you should say what a virtual table is as opposed to a real table. So you can expose a table in BC in Dataverse, but the data doesn't live in Dataverse. It's like a look, a view through into your data. Just like that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so, uh, you know, with a virtual table... The performance will be slower on a virtual table because the data it's going off to get the data rather than displaying the data from its own that that table itself. But building um, power apps and but you can't ever get a virtual table out of sync. No, because, it, because there is only of, one yeah, piece of data. It, it looks it up every yeah. time. So, so the so data still lives in BC. It's a bit like a flow field in BC it where you know yeah. it's never going to be the wrong total because it doesn't store the total; it calculates it on the fly. And that's the, this is the first time in the release of BC that they've made those virtual certain virtual. No, no. 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 they've been there a while, but it's just, just more more often. of them now. Yeah. And kind of a wizard to enable which ones you. you you're enabling and so on. So do you, it, it you, does look significantly easier to use. You install an app in Dataverse, okay. the, the business central kind of uh, app for uh, virtual tables, and then you go to that and you can see all the tables and then you can go and see all the data. Okay. So, so it's again, it's another small step. As yeah. we see a lot with yeah. cloud So software. if you've got other applications, then it's potentially easier to view yeah, your business yeah. central data. Yeah. With and, you, and you can still pick up triggers off that as well. Like so, CRM? So, so if you're in CRM. So and and I like virtual tables because, you know, compared to actually replicating the data from Business Central into CRM, for instance. Um, you know, virtual tables is much better than it uses yeah. Dataverse. But you, you've got data in yeah, yeah. at some point it will get out of sync. It's a tough one though, isn't it? Because, you, you know, we've spent years and years and years saying don't have your data in multiple places. Mm. And now we're saying actually sometimes have your data in multiple places <laughs> or have a view. Well, it's the, the data only way you can achieve places. what you want exactly, to achieve. Yeah. So you, you've got no yeah. choice. But the ideal really would be virtual tables. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. So we've done the Power Platform stuff that was on there. I don't know if we've got time to go through everything that's this Oh, this is exciting. But thing this is the, app, the actual application. <laughs> So what's you got, new you in the three application? application consultants in the room. Here. You're not going to get past the application <laughs> section. I think what frustrates us though now is we're like, ooh, but, but how how's it going to work? Yeah. What, you know, give us the detail. So you've got this um, availability overview. We, we want to see the, we want to see how it looks. Don't want to exactly see what it gives us. What does that mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's doing it some more granular views on uh, bins. So if you've got block bins or or dedicated bins, it can take that out of availability. Um, reservations can be included. Doesn't in that actually as well. say that though, does it? Does, does yeah, it? Yeah. Got, there's some detail in behind that one. A little bit F- feature details. For I example, saying, items yeah. might be reserved or pending put away. Shipment operations of picking log lets you review the item. I mean, I think include pick documents. Know, a lot of times, availability um, is a, is a common question during an implementation. Is it a way we calculate availability? Is this and this? Yeah. Um, I was doing a change request this week for like availability across multiple locations, some locations, but not others. And it's kind of like it, you end up, it's an area we end up customizing yeah. on a regular basis. Yeah, and potentially and so, you'll have multiple consultants who have done it a slightly different way. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be a tough one for them to to tick the box, I think. But it, if it gives us more capability, then yeah, that's a good thing. More capability at the box. And at least yeah. they're recognizing it's, yeah. it's an issue. 
I think the next one, right level of handling. So kind of, you know, That's nice understanding, uh, right, configure the right level of handling for different warehouse operations. So what the, what this basically means um, is kind of, you know, configure individual inbound and outbound operation sales or transfers or production orders and so on, what has to happen and whether you use inventory uh, movements, inventory picks, inventory putaways, or whether you use the full warehousing, so you create a warehouse shipment and a warehouse yeah. pick, a warehouse put away. And so you can and mix and match, basically. In, so in the, the, the same location. location. Yeah. 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 The, the complexity is well, At the moment yeah. now, it's by location, and that's yeah. it, isn't it? You so have the, full the, warehouse management or not. And you don't necessarily want to be doing full warehouse management on your production location, because you don't, yeah, you, know, you may not want to be always doing picking and, yeah. and put away. Might not be necessary. Yeah, had it. yeah. So it creates a lot of having ha- having that flexibility. Is, yeah. is I really mean, this is a, this is an, the next step up from what they did on the on the BC twenty two release of saying, um, you know, the in effect the advanced warehousing D yeah um, suggested um, locations um, and, and and bins D kind of. Um, complicating it from from just one tick box on yeah. the location card which was a very good thing and this is another a logical evolution on that and there's 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 another step in a bit as well we'll touch on which does cool. he even more do you jump down to that now if it's let's have a look uh, yeah put it on the spot yeah, last but one do you directly pick and put away suggestions for basic warehousing yeah, yeah. So, so the, the directed picks and putaways was one tick box on the location, which enabled a whole suite of functionality. Now, if you wanted just a bit of that, you couldn't. You had to go the whole hog. Okay. So, what, what, yeah. So, so what they've done now is is taking that away. I, I can't see really the point of having that no. tick box anymore. That may, Ever wrong. yeah, maybe that will go. Um, but you can do things like calculate bin replenishment. So, if you've got a pick face, yeah, you know, when you get down to a certain quantity. Without. Pull another pallet down. You can do that without directed now. Okay. And, and so, I mean, it talks about we've enabled capability for basic warehouse configurations to do a bit more. Is that, that the yeah? yeah. So it's yeah. much yeah. more granular and it's much more kind of um, so it's previously. Not, it was a big if challenge. If you wanted that little bit, everything. you had to have yeah. everything. Yeah, yeah. Now that, which you added a whole host of complexity. Okay. So it's much better. Tra- yeah. Training and things like that. I mean, it, it probably maybe. Um, you can argue that it takes implementation a bit longer because you've got to go through each process and decide and exactly make a decision, what you want to do. Yeah, but ultimately, it it's save long. But you've got more choice, yeah. so it's a good thing. Okay. Right. Next one I'm excited about. What, financial is, consolidation? Uh, well, intercompany transactions across business central env- environments and consolidation across environments. Yeah. So, you know... <laughs> Finally. Um, finally, <laughs> yes. Um, we've come into the real world of um, not just because, you know, you have an environment. So a typical reason for having multiple environments is I have a UK implementation and I've got another company in France or Ireland or somewhere else, um, you know, US maybe. Um, and you want to do a group consolidation across multiple um, countries, um, you know, you don't have export files anymore yeah. from it seems and and kind of you know we've had uh, web services i think in in navision since 2009 mm-hmm. and finally maybe the application is using them to pass data across multiple entities so this the combination of this this is a big one i think for international implementations where um you know suddenly we've got um the ability to set up data going across um, multiple entities and so on. It's it's as opposed to all if being the do, same yeah, database. Yeah, I I, I, feel, I I feel like that if you ha- if you have that now, there is a good chance that you have significant development in that area or a third or apps, party application yeah. on sure. top of it, which and the knock on effect to those is is going to be significant. I think. Yeah, the third party application, I think, will perhaps you know less. Um, I think the last release had some kind of data management across multiple companies, but it, because it didn't have multiple environments as well, it was probably a situation where you were always going to use that third party, you know, the ISV solution. And the same with the, the kind of intercompany transactions. I think Microsoft, I feel sorry for the guys who do the third party applications because I think Microsoft clearly is on a mission to kind of narrow that gap and make it standard out of the box. And I get why Microsoft are doing that because you know international implementations are are, are seen a, a big rise in the number of corporates this year who are saying we want to roll out in these countries um, and set it up 
um, internationally, um, and you know, Microsoft is facilitating that left, right, and centre. Uh, why wouldn't they? There's a lot of lot of business there for them if they do. Okay. Okay. So uh, jumping on down, we've got a few more there. So is there anything uh, you want? Editing to... Excel on item journals and warehouse worksheets. You know, um, they've had that on general journals and stuff for a while. Um, I think I think you know, item journals and, and warehouse. Um, transactions probably going to get more frequent use than it is on a general journal yeah, where okay. you know I post a general journal for this once a month I'm probably doing it daily weekly um, in the right situation so I think I think that's a really good thing and and particularly for go lives I think that will be yeah. um, massively useful okay do we have lots of customers use that the editing Excel yeah oh interesting yeah. what about lot checking though that's always a uh... that's is that covered? That's, that's another feature that on onboarding a bit later. Is it? Okay. Yes, yeah. Oh, we'll come back to that then. Um, more timesheets. Timesheets. That's yeah. just been out so to a, approvals. approve multiple ones. Yeah. But they, I don't, is that a good thing? Does that mean that people don't look at them properly? They just just batch approve them? And, and, but you've also Because you wouldn't do that, would you, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> no, of course. Um, you've also got um, approval kind of hierarchy as well. Whereas yeah. it, at the moment it's it's flat. It doesn't follow the normal yeah. BC yeah, workflows. It's, 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 you, one person yeah. approved, don't approve. Yeah. So it's it's a it's a bit more capability yeah. in the functionality. We, we haven't got that many customers that use. And, we and, use them ourselves, but we haven't got huge numbers of customers that use timesheets. No, I th- I still think that, that if you really want to make timesheets fly, you know, the timesheets on the mobile app application, I think later on they're, they're talking about doing some improvements to the mobile application mm-hmm. like introducing barcode in reading which is okay let's great. be honest people still can fill them in right <laughs> or on time but so <laughs> you can make them as usable as you want there speaks somebody who like has to chase a lot of time sheets i guess um but you know look make it easy for people to do it and i think they're more likely to do it so i, I think i think there's a lot of um yeah. If you Excuse look at the professional ser- if you look at the professional services add-ons for Business Central, most of them have a completely different way of doing yep. the timesheets and all the rest of it. Yep. Because the core one is a bit and, and the issues Off you have are not related to the application, are they? That's, no, they're, that's they're, a human. They're, they're, that's a yeah, human yeah that, that's people. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have no solution for that, other than a, other than a cattle prod. Yeah. <laughs> You've also got the ability to copy timesheets as well. To that's another thing. Again, not as sure that it's a good thing, but yeah. that's my personal Dangerous, opinion maybe. based on my uh, cynicism over many years of chasing timesheets. Yeah. Um, approvals for intercompany journals, that's another improvement on um, intercompany, but it just it, it kind of makes it follow the same process as yeah. um, intercompany as transactions. We talked about suggest the next steps for sales and production orders. This is an interesting one. So, um, this kind of links into reservations and um, what they've basically done is give a reservation worksheet um, and information on sales and production orders that tells you how how reserved is this document. So what do I mean by that is that if a particular line on a sales order is fully reserved against inventory, and that's the difference against inventory, not anything because the moment if you see it it can be anything and you don't know it's just reserved production order for 2027 yeah so you don't know whether you can pick it or ship it or start production looking at the components so now it breaks that down at the line level to say is it fully reserved against inventory partially or not Um, real poor implementation at the document level though so at the sale if you're looking at a sales order and you want to know okay can I pick and ship this whole sales order, you have to go into the statistics page for that sales order to go and look at that status. Yeah, because how does this work with the um, partial shipment and complete shipment as well? Because it should really tie into that, You'd shouldn't it? You'd hope so, yeah. So, I mean, like, cus- customers want a oh, list yeah. of sales orders and the status what on can the list. I, yeah, what can I ship, what can't I ship? They don't want to go into each sales yeah. order. If I've got a thousand sales orders, I have to go into each one, click on statistics, the page that nobody ever goes yeah, into. Well, go, Ooh. I, well, yes, but the performance aspect of, because, of, you know, the, the difficulty with this type of status... Point? Don't do it. <laughs> the, the difficulty with this type of status is that something over in the warehouse or manufacturing changes, you know, output's done in manufacturing. Yep. What sales orders does it have to go update? So, you know, going into the statistics page, the one thing it can do is say, okay, you want to know all of this now, I'll go off and check. So it does that check. If you put it on a... I mean, you're suggesting on, a, on the sales order list, we implement it a different way, don't we? Oh, come on, boys. Come it on. doesn't have to be live. Um, you know, maybe so it updates every minute. I or agree from like a that. usability aspect, that would be ideal. But from a performance aspect, 
flipping heck. Every time it shows a sales order, it has to go and do check a million different places within BC. That's going to be a hell of a performance. But, but why produce something that won't? Yeah, you know, let's watch the, the uh, telemetry on that one. See how much that gets you. Yeah, I think that's done. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, um, it's, it's, at least even put it on the sales order screen rather than the statistics. So at least you can see it on the sales order. I mean, I. I I, I can see that from both sides. Two out, two out of see, ten the, for me on that the, one. The, 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 my, <laughs> I'm afraid. I can't wait to see this Brutal. in real life because I think we've got so many customers that have got so many different kinds of modifications mm. in these areas. Oh, area, yeah. You, know, you need some and yeah. It, yeah it, As a distribution specialist, we've had yeah. to tackle it m multiple times. Yeah. And, um, so I, th I think it is there. And, and you're right, the customer wants a list of sales orders that I can actually do something with. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think I, I'm I'm excited about it because they've given us a mechanism to uh, to use. I think the way that it's been presented on the statistics. Yes, so yeah. don't disagree that nobody's going to go open the sales order, go into statistics next. Open the sales, next sales order, go into statistics. They're just not going to work through that way. So we're going to have to build some pages that kind of utilize that function in a in a way. But we're going to need to be careful. Yeah. About the performance aspect of that. There's, there's, there's a lot of details on that one than anything else. So. There's, a, yeah, there's a nice, you know, there's there's a uh, reservation worksheet. So typically, this is yeah, you, you you come in on Monday morning, let's say, and you've had some purchase orders received over the weekend or first thing in the morning. Okay, what can we now ship? So it, it's kind of matching that. Okay, we've now got yeah. some stock. These are the sales orders or production orders that I, I can now go reserve. That's really useful. It is really useful and it gives us a better basis to make sure that when we're dealing with these requirements for the customer, we're doing it in a more consistent way. More standard way. But yeah. there, will be, there will be stuff missing. So I know when we've done this for customers before, what do you do for customers on credit hold? You know, using clever credit, the customer do you do they do you get, reserve, do you reserve the, stock? the stock or do you not? Some customers do, some don't. Exactly. You know, what about um you know, so so there's lots of kind of nuances, but this I think it will give us a, a stronger base to work from so mm. that it is more consistent in the way that we deal with these um but the devil is in the detail. I mean it, it know, is the, in, in and you know the, it every distribution people. company does a does a, a warehouse receipt, okay, right, what does what sales orders can we now ship? You know, and it's whether the sales order is full or partial and kind of how does that work. So if, you know, the problem is we've got lots of job queue processes. So after yeah, we have, sometimes they book all the receipts in, then they do the process to go and see what they can, what that then enables to ship. Because if you do it after, you know, we're typically booking in pallet by pallet. So, you know. If you do that yeah. process after and how, each pallet, how far it forward do you go with your reservation? Just, so if you've got an yeah. older sales order, but it's not due to be shipped until later yeah. than a newer sales order, which one gets the stock? And and that's the nuances of each individual company and how they choose to work when it comes to reservations. And, and the reservations, yeah. The other scenario is I scrap a production order because I've got a quality problem on it. What does that mean? Do I then go and unallocate all my reservations and reallocate based on a first come first serve basis, or or how does it do? So there is it's it's a complex area. Well done Microsoft for for having a go at something because sometimes they just go oh that's too complex and step yeah. away. But it will be interesting to see what we've done. So. Um, Okay. You're still sticking with the two. <laughs> two out of ten. For that, for that bit. Not the you whole thing. Oh, not, no, not, not the whole thing. Not the whole feature. I'm going to release that's a solid harsh. five. Go on then. We'll have to score all these. Well, that's been great. <laughs> okay, so the next one, uh, sync document posting dates for sales and purchases. Yeah, it's a set up thing. That big, big, we've got the yeah. um, document date, posting date, the VAT date. It's, it's just some setup as to how they link to each other. Okay. I mean, it didn't get me ultimately excited that one because um, I think it's it's not an area. You would like to have a change, guess right? as to how many date filters there are on a sales header table and sales line. Date filters. How many and date the, fields? fields. That something yeah, yeah. header and line. Yeah. I'd say twelve. Have you got the answer for this? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I might go and uh, check out. Well, the confusion for customers on a sales order is seeing the due date and they assume that's the, the date oh, it's, it's going to be due to be delivered yeah. to the customer. I know, I know, I know. So, wow. Troubleshoot Shopify integration issues. It's just a log. You can turn a log on and, and then work out okay. what's going on in the background. A bit more information for you, okay? So moving on to the AI side then, shall we? 
Do, do we, can we not talk about usability movements well has inventory and tracking because Matt meant uh, yeah, I think I think it was. If it isn't there, um, th- there is the ability, I believe, to help you doing item journals with item tracking. Yes. Oh, that, okay. no, that's 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 more of a demo kind of environment. They they talk about is um, y- you go in, you go to ship a I don't know a, a sales order. You create a warehouse shipment and you ship it, and, and tr- or you try, or you create a warehouse shipment and try and open it, and it says that your user isn't set up in oh. as a warehouse employee. Warehouse. It can now do it on the fly for you. Yeah. But hopefully you can turn that off because if they're not supposed to be a warehouse so, yeah. employee <laughs> in that location, you know, it's like the ret- if you have a returns location and you only want one or two people in there, it's kind of, oh, it might be for a reason. Generalise your locations are back. Did you and Adam? Did they go away? away? They did go away and now they're back. Oh, I, I didn't know they went away. away. But I don't really know many people that use them, but I don't know why because they're quite good to, yes, to distribute good. costs across yeah. um What I noticed on there, just... Just open it, Liam. It talks of one of the interesting things on there. It talks about cost tran- uh, allocation of tr- uh, transactions in journals, sales documents, or purchase documents. Yeah, which it, which is interesting, isn't it? Because before you'd have to post an invoice to, and I'd know people who bef- previously would post to like um, an overhead cost centre right. and then redistribute it later. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas this sounds like you're able to do it at the point of posting. So, if for example, you've got your, I don't know. Um, uh, computer licensing and you want to uh, uh, distribute it across cost centres based on the number yep. of users or whatever you can do that at the point of posting on a I mean that, that could but I don't know that, that don't, could be interesting that. yeah because that, that could kind of offer some other possibilities yeah. Yeah, where people are so is that whereas the way you, I've seen you, it done before I mean you, post you can it. define your allocation keys based on statistical accounts so if you set up a statistical account as a number of users, you could then say there's this many users in production, yeah, therefore yeah, percentage yeah, goes yeah. across to that. I mean, that will be quite... Well, um, your payroll journal as well. Yeah, that's quite like, um, that's quite advanced. And, and that's a really good use of statistical accounts. I like statistical accounts. I mean, they were introduced in 22. And, and I think some of the reporting um, features that you can, some of the reporting challenges that we had before, um, you, you know, statistical yeah. accounts are... Yeah. are, are Oh, I'm a wondering, nice wondering, new feature, I'm, I'm, and that's a nice new addition to, on top of it. I'm wondering on things like sales posting, whether you could do things like commission, and yeah, you, know, you could start to account for parts of that yeah. in different ways, and yeah, does it, I think, royalties, or you know, right. might have some additional features that you could perhaps use it for. Copilot. Okay, so we've so, heard well, from Microsoft so, is Copilot. Well, 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 released yeah, well, without some Copilot features. This is the features. first, also as well though. This is the first time that we haven't yet mentioned bank reconciliation. <laughs> and it's coming in every single new release. <laughs> However, this I think is quite exciting. Yeah. So these the Copilot is Microsoft's name for their AI. 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 For their AI offering, um, and this is the first two things we've had in BC that's you think are useful. Well, it, I think this is well. I um. I was, the best. Yeah. I think so. Let's, this let's is protect, see, this see is, how well it performs. Yeah. In, in, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's so, been it's been a little bit of a standing joke, really. How many times they've had to improve the bank reconciliation process, and I think that's because it is almost infinitely variable about how you do your reconciliation process. So, you know, AI where it can kind of watch what's historically happened and derive what should therefore happen in the future. This is probably a very good place to Yeah, to so this is about it. being able to import transactions directly from banks and it being able to work out which account or how to allocate it yeah. and all those, which is a massive time saver potentially. Massive. I mean, this combined with kind of the, um, you know, the open banking integration yeah. potentially. Well, I was talking really to them about this and, and about kind of where, what, yeah. what, the standard system can do and what they do and, and how it all links together and I think that the two together in terms of time saving for yeah. you know 50 quid a month or whatever it yes. quid a month whatever, I, can't, I can't remember how much it is but it was a potentially a huge time saving some customers that, that have yeah whole Hundreds volumes to deal with yeah, 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 yeah. they've yeah. got a team of people doing Hundreds. this manually yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And then there's also the, the marketing suggest, suggestions, <laughs> the descriptions. That's, it's, that's it's, exciting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think it, it's, just, it's just going to release rather than yeah. it being... Uh, yeah, the preview, rather than preview. preview. So it, it's what we've seen in the 22 yeah. release. Um, there's some country-specific stuff. I don't yeah, know. It's but, but too. First one's useful. Um, yeah. So where you can set a language and have been able to, since 
probably that one, yeah. um, against a customer um, and suppliers. You can also set a, a regional, and, and so think, formatting things like dates can then kick okay. in. And, and I presume things like currencies and you know, commas instead of full stops and things like that. So oh, that's quite useful. Yeah. And then you've got supporting more countries and more regions. Yeah, and, that and keeps on growing, that doesn't you it? You know, keeping well, up with the legislation in all those different countries. But I don't think there's anything UK specific there. It's, I mean, it's difficult to find a country that's not supported now, isn't it? That's of any decent size. Now, there's some, some development changes. So. Yeah, um, Liam's an expert on this area. Yeah, isn't uh, it? <laughs> <laughs> he got three minutes through a development podcast last night. <laughs> Yeah, let's keep this high level. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, 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 yeah, you can use VS Code from a web client and, and so on. Uh, to, and that's useful kind of, you know, if, if you're trying to do some kind of uh, debugging process or wherever, you can just jump onto an environment much quicker than setting up your VS Code to connect and all the rest of it. Um, uh, turn off data analysis mode. So they introduced the analysis mode in BC22 on Make pages. Turn it off. <laughs> now you've got a property so you can turn it off on pages because there's a lot of list pages where it's just not appropriate. Yeah. Um, so I think I think that's um, yeah that that was needed. Um, and I think analysis mode. Um, th there's a few other uh, improvements in terms of um, that. Um, the, the next one actually turn off indexes as a partner. So Standard Business Central has lots of uh, you know, standard indexes um, that it has to update. So every time it updates a record, in effect, it has to go and update the related indexes. You know, if you're if you're a five user in implementation, this is not going to be um, any consequence. But the larger and larger, the the, the big, um, you know, hundred user plus. Um, implementations that we get into sometimes. Sometimes there's an index, they're not even populating the field, which actually makes the update of the index yeah, really bad so because where does it insert it? it yeah. um, and you can go and turn those off. So um, it, it's part of the, you know, we used to do it on prem. We used to go and disable invoices when it was on prem. Now we've got the ability to do that on SAS and potentially there are performance gains from doing that. Um, so, so the telemetry potentially can yes, indicate where yeah, yeah. it's doing when it it's and then not, potentially yes. switch off. So we go do it. I mean, it. there's, yeah, there's going to be some caution. time and cost. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolute <laughs> caution because... Yeah. Get, turn off the wrong ones. Oh, yeah, Don't yeah, turn yeah. them all off because um, you might find that you know, it's actually so... Turn them all off. Yeah, your system will fly. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, the other one built in. So they built in a HTML text editor for e the emailing part and, and they didn't allow de devs to use it for any other part of where you wanted rich text against item descriptions or something. So you had to use a third party one. Um, they've now made that available. Um, they were strangely slow in doing that and I think they were a little bit, uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of things that they still want to do with it but they've, they've given in to the nagging um, and, and made it available for us devs to, to use where we want to. So rather than using a third party and, you know, the standard one looks has a strangely slightly different set of buttons for bold and italic and picking your fonts and so on. The bit that um, you need to be careful with is if you're using that and then you're printing it on a um, an RDL, a, 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 you know, a document, a, a document um, potentially... Um, RDL does not support every HTML kind of type of tag. Um, so quite a lot of the situations you want to limit the, the rich text editor to what you can actually print. Any word, because, your word layouts? Um, well, word layouts potentially is not going to be the same problem, is yeah, it? Yeah, because so, you're in Word anyway, don't you? Better in Word anyway. So. I mean, you know, I we are word, doing word now, to handle it better. Yeah. You know, we, we are doing now more and more word layouts. Oh, definitely. It's yeah, like yeah, yeah. Yeah, almost the exception where we're going back to yeah. RDL now, yeah. um, which is which is good news. So, um, okay, so we've had had some tools um, or improvements in tools for our dev team and, and of those. So, governance administration. 
Is there anything that grabs your eye on here? A sign granular access well, route. So I mean, it goes back to the multi-region scenario. Yeah. So if, if a customer's got, let's say, a UK environment and a Dutch environment and a US environment, and let's say they have a US partner looking after that US environment, you can then give access to the US partner just to the US okay. environment and UK, UK and Dutch. Dutch and if you have a partner looking after CRM yeah, it's a and a partner looking after Business Central, you can just say... It's you know, great to see those tools maturing as the product's yeah, growing yeah. And, and we need more control and security obviously so important these days. And, and actually I'll big up the Business Central team because the, what they've done with GDAP is way better um, than the much bigger team within Microsoft have done on kind of Power Platform and uh, CRM. So if you go talk to the CRM guys um, about kind of, um, you know, what GDEP gives you access to do, they're still in lots and lots of scenarios. They have to have a user that's set up for the partner to use, which yeah, is a whole it's, bag of That's yeah. been around nails. for a while and caused yeah, it, and, always and causes kind of, problems. So it? I think the Business Central team have got it working really, really well um, and, and have done a, a really good job on, on that. Excellent. Okay. Um, under the legislation, I'll probably just point out that the large companies one, very, very few of our customers affected by this, but it's like the payment practices report. Yeah. Um, so there's that that's available now, will be available for, for the large organisations that need that. Um, Most partners had the report written, didn't they? But yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's in the standard product. I now. suppose the, the advantage of that is if it needs changing for legislative Go reasons, then it gets updated. The government's and administration improved update release processes and i'll read this customers who don't manually schedule their environment updates can expect updates to start quickly after the start of the environment update window to deploy updates more grandly gradually to environments they don't manually schedule the update to a different date update availability and default scheduling will vary per region i don't really understand um they're trying to make sure that the updates i mean if you didn't schedule your update on a particular date it kind of you came in each morning has it happened has it happened has it happened and and then what they're saying they'll they'll do the updates as close to the start of the update window as possible Mm. um Mm. good thing (laughs) no oh again i sound like a right old cynic i know that but um, no, I don't think it is a good thing. I think we, we've we've had lots of issues over the last um, over the last few releases where there's been issues where releases have started and stopped and started and stopped and started and stopped, um, and 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 that's led me to think that um, under our managed service we schedule the releases as late as possible to allow for those teething issues to. That's always been the case with updates, however, though, isn't it? The problem with that is then you end up with them all bundled up. So you end right up the back with 23.3 going in, sorry, 22.3, and then 22.4 virtually immediately. And you don't really want to be jumping. So, I, yeah. This is always going to be one of the, there's loads of advantages of having this, you know, SaaS software. There's always yeah. been updated concept. We as the partner having to pick up some of the load and hopefully the customer doesn't get impacted too much by the stop start nature is what we're trying to do but you're right I mean that's the downside to this is they're pushing stuff out I do think we see more of that as a, a, as a partner yeah you know as, as the customer you know, we're dealing with that yeah we're trying to buffer that we're well, yeah, we, yeah hopefully the customer doesn't that's what we that, want that's but, what the money service um, is all about isn't it that we, yeah. we take that over and, and worry about it rather than them but um, I, I think that there's still some evolution of this to go I think you know um Something that's been talked about for a lot is updates to the platform and updates to the application um, and and separating those two. So you can have your application a couple of point releases older than your platform. So Microsoft update the platform on which it runs. That takes me back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes. 2000, oh, you know, lots of those. Yes. Three, um, now 3.6 3. of 2009 executables. You know, and, and there's the whole kind of when... Um, you know, so, so Microsoft um, at Tech Days um, previewed in their preview section, they, they uh, previewed uh, the testing tool um, that's been under NDA that we haven't been able to talk about on like, the podcast, but they previewed that at Tech Days, um, kind of what, June time. Um, 
so finally that's out of NDA and and you know, what we really need is to develop much better much richer testing automated testing scripts for each customer so that we can run through those quickly because with manual testing currently being yes you can write scripted tests and they they have value but they're not the complete picture um, until Microsoft get the testing tools yeah. more comprehensive and more usable by end users and consultants as opposed to written by devs um, at the door, the, the update process on a monthly basis is not going to be but quick and smooth. Quick summary of what is the new testing tool? So the new testing tool, so um, this is something that kind of, you know, at the moment the only way you can do automated tests is you sit there and you write code and you write a library call to create a customer and then a library call to create an item and then a library call to create a sales order header and then add lines to the sales order header then post the shipment. And so that, you know, that, that code can, um, an automated test in code can be 200, 300 lines long. Um, and then once you've written the first one, you can go and amend it to do the variation. So the second one's always quicker than the first one, but it's still quite a, long and therefore expensive process to, to build a set and to build a comprehensive automated testing library i think you know that there's most products so most app source products the good ones have an automated testing library because that's part of product development but very few end users um, have uh, an updated you know a full comprehensive library of of everything tested and um, that's a big ask and a big um, ticket, you know, a, a lot of money to create. So what they've done is they're introducing a kind of robotic process automation type system. What does that mean? Sorry. Um, it means basically you fire up Business Central, you click a kind of record button, you go through the process and you say, right, I would test. And you do in effect your manual test and it's recording what you're putting in at each stage and then you say um, you, you you click um, to say right the test is that this field should have this value in it now um, it's not it's not using kind of where your mouse is on the screen it's actually using um, the kind of uh, the control if you like so it's jumping to a, a named field for for the input and so on so good. when the update comes through if something's moved on the screen it's not going to break yeah. your test it's a, it's a it's a lot more robust than that it saves that test it then generates the script that the dev might have written for you okay Sounds so you really can have that script it, and you can log that into a library and potentially then you can take that out the lot when a new release sandbox comes through and take that out of the library and use the kind of devops process to run that test against the new version and see whether it passes or fails um really exciting um come on vincent if you're listening um we need it we need it i know that uh, microsoft are keen to kind of get every last bit polished and finished but um it's i think it's going to be one of the biggest single kind of quality improvements i think uh, to business central yeah. that that we've seen in decades well, we see customers understand the, the reason for having automated testing yes but then you give them the price for doing it and they're like <gasps> it's it's, a well, tough it's the time as well yes, it's, it's, it's yeah. not it's it's the time scale of what it does to their project to build automated testing alongside kind of any customizations that they're doing and and kind of can you take the automated tests from an isv and integrate them into yours well most isvs don't publish their test there's another little rant i could go on there they should um, so you can't run you know if you've built anything with the any customization on top of a dependency on a third party then how do you test that and kind of it doesn't it doesn't so at the moment I'm sorry, I'll be blunt. The, the, the automated testing process is really tough to make work in a typical end user environment. It works in a product environment. It doesn't work in an yeah. end user environment. Certain, where certain, it's certain, multiple vendors. Certain areas, I think, on you know, if, if it's project-based development, if you've got a real complex bit of functionality, actually you can save yourself a lot of time. 
by if you, investing in it. And it is an investment, but, but over the course of the project the the, yeah. and the, certainly the life of it, you'll get your money back on that. And the bad news now is now the cat is out of the bag with this new way of testing. Nobody's writing any automated yeah, tests. Well, yeah. it's kind of like, yeah. why are you going to invest in, in kind of the last that? I mean, I think unit tests. So, you know, the, the, there is a place that the current... Um, testing regime still has a place in the new world because unit tests which kind of you know I write a function as part of the um, development process if I write a test for that function that says I pass these parameters in this is the what I should expect out you can run that function the problem is writing what I call scenario tests which is I create a customer create an item I create a sales order I post it I try and you know try and pick it in the warehouse and kind of like that the, the, the automated tests that you're writing now, which are three, four, five hundred lines long, okay, those will go to the new testing tool, I think, rather than be written 500 lines long. Because if you've got a piece of code that's 500 lines long, you've got to maintain it, and that's actually a big ask, even once you've, you've originally developed it. So I think, I think you know, we're going to have the two tools, two sets of tools that we need for testing in the future, and that's going to make the update process um, much better and you know, yes if I, my rule of thumb is if it takes an hour at the moment to run the manual test through just you know firing up the screen and putting in what you need to do then you should write an automated test I think that's going to come around to if it takes you five minutes to test it yeah. record an automated test mm. log it in the library you've got it there and and yeah that's going to then um, the whole managed service will be part of running those well, automated I tests. Point out that we haven't had huge amounts of issues with, with customers, uh, with, with custom development not working as part as the result of updates. You know, but um, that's because very, we're pretty good, damn good in a, in the managed service. You know, yeah, we, we we do pick them up um, on the managed service, but we do, we haven't had huge issues with that. Um, it's usually something that gets. It's a pretty experienced team to do area. that, though. That's the, I mean, you know, you need people who are pretty switched on to what customizations has this custom got, customer got, and can kind of spot the flaws of, uh, hang on, that's going to interrupt that. So well, we've drifted a little bit off uh, of what's in the <laughs> the update, the improved update process. You know that, yeah. I, I hope Microsoft. There's more work to do. Let's just put it, and the detail will come through. I mean, you talked a little bit about the platform there. They have made some improvements again. If, every time we see this, don't they? Where yeah. hopefully everything's going to be a bit quicker. Well, that's, that's just a learning curve, isn't it? You yeah, know, they're looking they, at their telemetry. Yeah. I'm guessing, and how they can improve. And well, the biggest single refine. one. So again, there's, a, there's you know, there was a cryptic re, um, uh, reference to performance improvements in here, um, and uh, some some people went on and was asked what that exactly um, was about and then that ca came out of the bag was they published and there's been a couple of blogs so it, again it's in the public domain it's not under NDA anymore we had this situation where every time you had a table extension in a different extension it created another table which it joined at the point at which the main table was read um, at the SQL level and once you got like past four table extensions um, now four sounds a lot, um, but when you've got some of the tables like sales line or item table, um, which you know lots of different ISVs extended, and obviously ISVs then on a share, so that was very difficult for them to avoid it and, and get the right configuration. You could quite easily get up to four, five, six table extensions. Then you had a couple of customizations that added a couple more table extensions, and the performance died, and you know that. That, that could become a major issue. And we've had to be very careful in the kind of architectural side to, to make sure how many table extensions we're putting on any single main table. Now, what they're saying they're doing as part of the performance improvements for 23, and this is one I would bet will be late and apparently it's going to be turned on and, and perhaps in preview in for 23, is that all of the table extensions that you put on a single table will go into one table, okay? So you will have a main table and in if, if you like a single additional table. So there will only be one join. So they will put all the fields from the different table extensions in the different uh, extensions into one table. If you remove a field from a table extension, 
because that was the kind of if you remove an extension how does it you know it could take that join out that extra table extension out they will just disable those fields in that additional table so that sounds a kind of you know that's a way of that will be a significant performance improvement for those bigger, more complex implementations. How do they deal with things like code behind those? And if you've, you know, you'll only be able to reference those fields from your, from the uh, extension that's got the table extension in it, yeah. or got a dependency on it. Um, so again, so those fields will be left in. Now there is a complication because SQL has a limit of an eight k limit on how big a record could be. And we used to hit this back in the in the CAL days where you'd add lots of fields to the sales header or, or the sales line. The sales line. And right. some of some of those fields were not best designed. So somebody go and put six 250 character text fields because I want them as large as I possibly can get them um, on the sales header and suddenly you couldn't add the extra date field you wanted or whatever as, as another customization. If you think about that 8K limit is still there on that additional table. So, you know, what's going to happen when you're adding another um, uh, option from AppSource and it gets in, it's trying to extend a table that's commonly extended, customer table, you know, that's commonly extended. And it hits that 8K limit and can't extend it further. So that that's still to be seen. I think there are some, a lot of questions around this. I'm excited around the performance improvement, but I'm also kind of in the wrong circumstances and where people don't follow best practice. Um, I think design is going to be even more important that you you know you're really careful about what you add, um, um, and and you really have a good understanding of um, don't use big text fields use a binary object field and kind of flush it in there because that's held the way that's held is slightly differently and that doesn't count um, you're really going to need to know what you're doing you know if you if you've added those fields to that companion table and then I come along and say you shouldn't have done that and you remove them okay they're deactivated but they're still in the 8K calculation. So how soon will they flush through and get scavenged back so that that space is reusable? So you could really um, complicate things a little bit. So a uh, lot more to kind of done. I think it's it's great that Microsoft are kind of um, doing stuff around performance still. Um, yeah, performance now is is really getting to a point where it's not a concern if the um, if you've architectured it right, it's it's more around what process are you trying to do at the same time, um, and how you've configured the application rather than the, it has an inherent constraint. Okay, so coming back out of some of the dev and the performance stuff, come back to yeah, well, this the, is the, the user, user experience. Yeah. So back to what people will notice or be able to. Uh, be aware of themselves. Um, anything on there? The top one. Yeah, existing table <laughs> fields swapped hash pages. Wasn't that? Wasn't that in the, la that so was was in the last release? No, yeah. it, so it wasn't. Was it? No, was it? Never made it. It's, uh, 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 the way I the read that as well that it's not the users that's going to be able to add any field. You go to the uh, profile, so the kind of users yeah. interface. And add the fields there, so it's more a kind of back end admin, admin, yeah. admin would do that rather than the user does, having any yeah. field they can yeah, choose. And yeah. at the moment, you would need a developer yeah. to do that. So I, 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 I have conversations almost every month here where customers say, "Oh, can we just add?" It's like, "Yeah, that, that's." It. Can you wait a bit because that's coming? Yeah, but yeah. It, it's kind of. I had the same reservations I had last time in performance of people going out in loads of flow fields to the list views but they're also really easy to remove I, sh I imagine if they're easy to add on yeah, they're easy yeah. to remove so okay okay um and then there's um data search that so in bc obviously for ages we've had alt q where you can search for functionality when you do that search um there's a, a little thing that appears below that says search company data so the search for company data has been in there a few versions. You have to set up which tables you want and you want to, to allow it to search from. Yeah. But in effect, there's then that's there's an index built up in the background, so you can then search for customers or products or whatever you decide. 
um, and that then comes up in this search list. So that, that's that's a nice feature. It's, it's not a, a Google across the entire system. Um, the search has been going better and better every yeah, time. Yeah, isn't yeah, it? People yeah. do use it. You know, I've watched you demo, and you just always go to the search to pull up what you're looking for, rather than trying to remember where it is. So it's always good. Um, uh, distinguished brass title, as I'm probably the only one at this table that multitasks. HR <laughs> <laughs> to the building, please. Um, that's, that's quite neat. So, what would explain what that is? So, so it just, it just means just, if you've got multiple tabs open, you, you can, can see which tab, tab is different than, yeah, or yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the caption's a bit more user friendly, yeah. okay. a bit more descriptive yeah. on there. Okay. Which is, yeah. yeah, but these are all good things we should say, like your average user will, oh, they, they probably. They'll like that more than some of the stuff we've been talking about. Yeah, yeah, tables yeah, yeah. It means something to them, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, any more that you want to pop uh, up? Manage user expectations with selection context-based actions. Um, if you select multiple lines on a screen, there's <clears throat> a certain functionality on the ribbon, let's say, let's say email or something yeah. like that, that the user might click, oh, I'll do that. Yeah. And it only takes the, the first the, probably one. the first yeah. one you've selected. Now what happens if you select multiple lines, those will grey gray out the ones you can't use. Right? Yeah, okay. So that's really nice. Yeah, it is annoying if you think yeah. you can do it and you yeah. can't. These are things like delete, can't if you can select multiple yeah. and you can't delete. I mean, this is where the, the UX is just improves every release. Yeah. And, yes. yeah, it's some really, really nice features in there now. Yeah. And it's great to see it continue to improve. Yeah. Okay. So Roll on uh, October. Yeah, so I think we've gone through the majority. There was well, there's reporting, reporting, reporting and reporting. data we analysis. Did jump, didn't we? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, jump yeah. back up to that. So, um, you know, the analyze group and pivot data on queries mm. on multiple using multiple tabs. So we had um, we had analyze previewed, I think, in in twenty two on on tables in a list. Um, so why is this important? Because um, Sometimes, uh, give an example. I might want a, a, a list, you know, analyze of item ledger entries, and there's detail from the item card that I want as part of that pivot table. Um, and I had to kind of, how did I link that across? And I had to start setting up flow fields to look up the data, or I had to add it to the page and, and, and do some coding to do that. Now I can build a query. Um, I'm hopeful that one day we'll get a user user query tool, but um, I can build a query. So in effect, I'm pulling uh, very efficiently, very performance um, optimum way. I'm building a query that pulls lots of information across and then pops that into an analyze view so that in effect, the user can slice and dice that in the way that they want to do it. I, that's a real biggie. Um, so it can be data from multiple tables, so you can join within the query. Yes. Okay. And that's without a developer. Um, to create so those, you need to be a developer. You need a exactly. query. You still but, need, you still but need Microsoft, a developer. But, but Microsoft are releasing some in this release, so some queries. That's where I some. want the user right. based query tool. Okay, so there's now some standard queries that you can yeah. use, um, but we don't know what they're going to be it's, yet. I think it was so finance, really. inventory, and sales. And though, I, I believe those are the same queries that also. Another part of it, link back to the Power BI reports that they're going to be introducing. So yeah. those same queries will then be available. I, for I Power think BI we will, as a partner, we will have an add-on extension which has a bunch of queries, queries in it. Queries that commonly, that, commonly that, that requested common, queries. Commonly re yeah. requested reporting areas. So tr rather than trying to use the standard list view, which is actually more of an operational list for managing sales orders, managing warehouse transactions, mm -hmm. etc., um, you know, you'll have a queries that you'll go into, which is kind of where it comes across that they're putting um, uh, discover report and data analysis content, including queries, reports, and Power BI pages by using a navigational search, tell me, or the new report explorer page. So in effect, they're, they're pulling all of the reporting so that you've got a guide of what you should use. And the, so uh, this means that you may no longer need some of the external reports that, that yeah, it's just bring, it's, using various tools in Excel. Yes, yeah, it's, it's bringing, it's getting getting bringing a lot in-house. What you can also do as well, so the Excel reports, which are, I think, still early days in terms of people adopting them, yeah. where you can take an Unused existing function. standard report, you can take the data set that's in that report and, and 
you know, often it's a lot more than you see on the report, the actual fields, and you can open that in Excel yeah. and it, in effect it chucks that into a table. Yeah. You can then do pivot charts and reports and whatever you want on that and save it back into BC. And then when you next run that report, you can choose that layout and you can have multiple layouts. So you, you know, if you want to, as long as you've got the data set, you're free to go and do quite a lot. Those queries that will be able to run against the Excel layouts as well. Okay. Yeah. So that's another nice feature. Yeah. I mean, to give you an idea of queries in terms of performance, I can remember about six years ago, we had queries in those days, I had a customer that was running an inventory valuation report and they'd got, they'd got nearly a million items and they got multi, multi millions amounts of value entry. So it's a big old database and it was taking a few hours to run the valuation report. And the FD said, all I need is by posting group, the totals. So I created a query, took it on a page, and it was about half a second to run. Yeah. It's that, you know, is that much difference? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Exciting. Well, I think we've got through not everything that's on the list, but everything that's uh, popped up for us. I mean, we normally come back and revisit this in October once yeah, it's actually shipped. Well, so we'll yeah. we'll give it some. I mean, September, once we get the preview, middle of September, I think we'll be back. Yeah. So we yeah. will uh, be back. Even, even that can change between. Yeah. yeah. September and October, can't it? But so, it's fairly close. It'll be interesting to see which ones of these, because typically some of these get pushed back in terms of, okay, we're not ready to actually push this out the door yet. It'll be in, you know, release one, release yeah. two, release three, or so on. It'll go back to, it'll be a December 23 release. So I think the general availability dates sometimes can, can change a little. Yeah, yeah. Um, so interesting to see which ones of those is it's done. But it, it's a good indication of what they're working it's good, it's good to get heads up as well because you know if somebody sit, says today we want something built around reservations we get well let's let's wait a little bit yeah, yeah. and then let's see what see we what we're see what we're going to get here okay well if you've listened to this it's quite a long podcast you're another hour and a bit closer to that release date of it coming so uh thanks for uh, thanks for joining us and well done yes. well done <laughs> uh, congratulations Liz, thanks. James, Matt thank you as always for uh, you know your uh, expert analysis of what's coming look uh, we we'll look forward to seeing it actually arrive on the platform and for everyone who's joined us today and for every, th- every other time you uh, you watch the podcast or listen to the podcast thanks for that and, uh, we'll and if s- you're lying by the pool on your vacation um you know, uh, go and have another beer or, or whatever cocktail is your choice because Something you probably strong. need it now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah but, but thanks very much for joining us and we all look forward to seeing you on our next podcast uh, for Techman Talks Dynamics. <laughs>